Okay. In particular, this specializes to two dimensions. And this is uh, the boundary conditions that we implicitly use for a two dimensional discrete Fourier transform. These are the periodic boundary conditions that we've always been using in our signal. Here of the 2D discrete Fourier transform. So the image in the center is being replicated uh, to infinity along all along all sides. Um, there's another representation. So this is uh, the torus representation. For one-dimensional signals, there is an equivalent representation in terms of, uh, of a circle, which is sometimes also called the Fourier circle. So let's look at such a spectral density. Here uh, on the left is an image. And in the middle is what you get out if you uh, enter a two-dimensional uh, discrete Fourier transform, uh, say, in, in MATLAB. In particular, the frequency 0, 0 is at the top corner. And then the, frequ the frequencies increase to the right until we have this maximum frequency from which point onwards they decrease again and they increase downwards up to the maximum frequency from which point on they decrease again. Now that is not the way that we're typically thinking of spectra. We usually want, excuse me, um, the frequency, uh, the zero frequency to be located in the center of the image. So we want the zero, zero to be here. And this is accomplished in MATLAB by a, an operation called FFT shift, which puts you know, this quadrant here and this one there, and this one here, and this one up there. That's an excellent question just what I wanted to know <laughs> of you. So the question is, uh, I hope you can discern that we have some you know, diagonal lines here, but also we have a very prominent vertical line there. So let's speculate where all of this comes from. Uh, not quite. So let's let's try and understand what the basis functions look like. So I show miniature versions of this image because I won't have enough space otherwise. Our Fourier basis functions are now complex plane waves. So in particular, let's say um, this point here corresponds to a moderately high frequency of the plane wave, which is moving out in a horizontal direction. If I consider this point here, it has a frequency that's twice as high. So I'm showing the ridges here of the plane wave. That point here would be a plane wave uh, traveling downwards. Oh, sorry, the frequency is too high, excuse me, because the, yeah, so there's our DC term. So here in the middle is the DC term. That's the average intensity of the entire image. And now this point here, I chose it to lie at roughly the same distance from the DC term as the other one. So I should indicate a plane wave traveling down 
which has about the same frequency as uh, the one that I first showed. Then uh, let's look at a uh, few diagonal points. So for example, this point here has a corresponds, so look at the angle, it corresponds to a very high frequency plane wave because it's far away from the origin going in this direction. So we really compose this funny image, which is in the Hofburg in Vienna, from a superposition of many, many, many plane waves. And the coefficients, which are here shown on a log scale, if it weren't for the log scale, you would just see the DC term because it's so much larger than the rest. These coefficients indicate how important each of these basis functions is to represent or to reconstruct the image. So we have as many coefficients in this reciprocal or in this Fourier basis as we had pixels in the original image. However, the original image was all real and these numbers are complex. So in fact, we have some, some symmetries in there, meaning we, we don't really need to store explicitly all these uh, complex numbers. But the question at the outset was, we have some, we see some structure here. What does it correspond to? I would like to start with uh, here this structure that we see here. So this spectral density here and there. Yeah. You think it's the stairs? They have the right, they have the right orientation. Um, so we're getting there, but it's not the stairs. Now this is a trick question. Uh, I'm going back to the illustration of the boundary conditions. The image framed in green is the one transformed, and this just illustrates the boundary conditions that the transform uses. Exactly, yeah. So you're totally right. Um, we have here a, a harsh transition between a bright area and a very dark area. So we have a very strong edge you know, from uh, almost zero to almost 255. And in order to explain this edge, we need to superpose many, many plane waves to, well, not to approximate it, to, to, to represent it exactly. So it is this harsh transition between white and black that explains these structures here. Very good. So what else? How about now? How about these uh, diagonal structures? There's something here and something there. Can I go up again? Sure. Exactly. So uh, you're right. So the red region. So here we have a sharp transition between bright and dark. And we need many plane waves in order to represent this sharp transition. Yeah, so if I have another color left, uh, so this one here, look at that, it has a different angle. Huh? So uh, this must be uh, that one, I think. Huh? So these, uh, where we see the energy is always orthogonal to the lines that we perceive in the in the image so if you uh, you know the 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 image which has the sparsest possible representation in pixel space apart from an empty image would be an image which has just one pixel on and all the rest off Right? I would I would have all pixel values to zero and just one bright pixel. This is the type of image which is hardest to represent in Fourier space. Because to construct such a, an impulse in the spatial domain, 
I need all frequencies. Vice versa, the, the image which is easiest to represent in the reciprocal domain is just an image of a plane wave. Yeah? So if you have just a modulation, bright, dark, bright, dark, this can be represented by a single, or if it's a real image, a pair of Fourier coefficients, uh, whereas all others could be zero. So these are the extreme images, and it, they show how complementary these two bases are. And then for normal images, like the one shown here, well, we need quite a bit of Fourier coefficients to uh, approximate it well. However, if we want to approximate it, we don't need all Fourier coefficients, as is shown next. So here is the... FFT shifted spectrum that we've just seen, but now um, all of those coefficients have been set to zero. And then after doing the inverse Fourier transform, here's what you get. The first image looks okayish, but is a little blurred because we're losing all these high frequencies here. So losing the high frequencies means we cannot represent sharp or very sharp edges anymore. As we uh, delete more frequencies, you can start to see these ringing effects. So uh, at least I on my screen, I see uh, a wavy pattern here. These are uh, the typical Gibbs oscillations. So when you have a step edge, but you're trying to approximate it with only a few oscillations. So you've, you've seen these images before. Um, what we want is a, is a step edge, and we're using only a few Fourier coefficients to represent it. And what we then get is something like this, so a ringing artifact. Of course, if we use, it's a unitary transform, okay? We lose no information in going to the other domain. So if we use all Fourier coefficients, we will perfectly reconstruct the black curve. But if we only use the first five or 10 coefficients, I get out something like I've sketched here in red. Well, these ringing artifacts are something that you can perhaps discern uh, somewhere here uh, close to the ceiling and in a few other places. So, of course, I lost information in going from the real Hofburg, which neglecting quantum mechanics, you know, is essentially a continuous uh, environment. Um, I lost information in uh, digitizing this continuous environment. So my pixel, my, my image consisting of a finite number of pixels is an approximation. But from there to the transform domain and back, there is, as long as I use all Fourier coefficients, there is no loss of information whatsoever and no noise added and nothing. Uh, this is really um, just a rotation into a different basis. No, so these are, um, you know, these are on the left hand side, these are not real numbers, but these are uh, integer numbers. And uh, I can compute with, uh, I, I can even do the computations, you know, in, uh, if I really desire in, uh, uh, in unlimited accuracy, uh, so to get the precise result. Okay, um, so on the right hand side, now look, we've used just very, very few of um, the, we've used just very few out of all Fourier coefficients, the ones corresponding to the lowest frequencies, and we get a very blurred rendering of the image. And at this level of detail, I can start to imagine that what we see here is actually a superposition of plane waves. So uh, I've forgotten how many coefficients these are. You know, perhaps these were still, I'm guessing now, 100 or so. Um, so I, I could imagine that if you sum 100 plane waves, you get an image like this. But the other images are also superpositions of plane waves. It's just uh, less intuitive. 
Yeah. So um, you are saying, so this is, of course, a great way of compressing, or maybe great is exaggerated. This is a way of compressing data. Um, I simply discard all the Fourier coefficients which were set to zero, and I keep just a tiny little bit of information here in order to approximate my image. Now, there are different alternative strategies. Uh, so here, I, I took actually really a small cube around the frequency zero, just smaller than the one shown here. Uh, alternatively, um, rather than choosing um, the coefficients with the lowest frequency, you could choose the coefficients which have the highest values. So if, for example, we keep the 5% of coefficients with the highest values, then we would have kept this funny star pattern from our original transform. And, you know, this altogether, the, the red thing that I've drawn, it makes up still less than 5% of the entire area, I would say. And if you remember when I talked about the hard thresholding in uh, BM3D, this is exactly what you do. You transform to the reciprocal domain, and then you neglect all coefficients which are too small. Except that uh, these people do not use the Fourier basis, but another unitary transform. They use a wavelet transform. But the principle is the same. Now, the nice thing about or the advantage of um, just choosing the few lowest frequencies is that you can do that regardless of what is the image content. Otherwise, if you say keep the 10% largest coefficients, you need to analyze where they are and you need to store not just the values, but also the positions of these values. Okay, um, I also want to show you more pictures of the basis functions. So again, this is uh, my special color coding of the complex plane. And this is one of these, uh, co well, complex exponentials here in, uh, in one dimension. Uh, this is the same thing. You know, just one is color coded, the other is shown geometrically. Now here is such a complex plane wave. In 2D. Now this is only for a 20 by 20 image. But if I had done this for, you know, 1200 by 800 or something image, this would be the kind of basis function that we've just used in the images that you've, that you've seen. So this is one plane wave, which, by the way, if, if I draw to scale, so let's say the frequency 0, 0 is in the middle, and the highest frequencies are then plus 10, and minus 10. And here I have one, two, three, four oscillations. So I am, uh, oh, excuse me, I'm somewhere here. If this is, uh, if this is my frequency axis k1, and this is my frequency axis k2, then the plane wave that I'm, I've shown here on the left hand side, uh, corresponds to roughly this point here in the in the Fourier transform of a 20 by 20 image. And there is a complex plane wave in 3D. Ah, okay. So um, actually I'm you know I was looking at this direction. Um, this is the wave vector k. And uh, I, I have not paid uh, close attention if it's if it's on this side or on that side, um, I would need to stare at it a bit more. But it's it's one of these two points. And the two points differ only, they have the identical real part and the complex part is uh, conjugated between these two points. So I'm looking at the, I'm looking, the answer is I'm looking at the wave vector. Um, no, I don't think so. Um, so asking about the orientation here. So um, you, you, let's say in the in the red part here we have a we have a step edge here. Okay. So we need plane waves that are oriented in this direction to represent it. 
and the yeah the wave vector yeah thanks for clarification is orthogonal on the plane wave okay and so long wave vectors means uh, densely spaced ridges and yeah yeah so the uh yeah so if i uh yeah, i didn't annotate my axis as i should uh this is k1 and this is k2 so this shows me the the orientation here gives me the orientation of the plane waves and Ah, okay, now we get to interesting questions. So um, when you rotate an image, you also rotate its uh, Fourier transform. So if I, uh, you know, let's say if I rotate this thing here by 90 degrees, which amounts to changing the axis, then I also rotate the image by 90 degrees. But it's not just true for 90 degrees, it's also true actually for any angle in between. Okay, and the color coding, um, so, so what I've shown here, uh, your question is a good one. So all of these numbers are complex numbers. And I've just shown the logarithm of the magnitude. Because, you know, the, the faces uh, are, are difficult to understand, at least at this kind of resolution. And in the colorful images, I have encoded the uh, really the, the the phase also. The magnitude being constant because we are here on the uh, on the unit circle in the in the complex plane. Okay, um, I will try and give more intuition by looking at a real world example. So. This is from a paper called Spherical Navigator Echoes for 3D Rigid Body Motion Measurement in MRI. Magnetic resonance imaging is special in that the images are acquired in K-space. So some tricks notwithstanding, what you essentially do is you measure your image in K-space pixel by pixel, or let's say, Fourier coefficient by Fourier coefficient, and then transform back to the real domain to get an image that humans can look at. So if the Hofburg fitted into an MR scanner, what you would do is you would, with your MR scanner, acquire these Fourier coefficients patiently, which is why MR scans take relatively long. You acquire these Fourier coefficients one by one, and once you have them all, you inverse inverse transform to get your the image of your patient to look at. Now this here is just the sampling pattern; it's not so important. Uh, what people do is they here take an image of K space. So let's say here is axis K1, and there is axis K2. And there is axis K3. And now between two images, they want to see if the patient has moved. And they assume that the patient is a rigid body, which is not correct because people breathe and deform, etc., etc. Yeah, but to a first approximation, let's say people can only move or rotate. And they want to know between two measurements how much has the person uh, translated or rotated or let's say object of study okay so they acquire so the full fourier transform would be a 3d cube out of this 3d cube they only acquire the fourier coefficients on the surface of this sphere this is what's shown on the left hand side this is the sphere and you acquire fourier coefficients only on the surface of this sphere now shown in B and C are the magnitude of 
um, these Fourier coefficients on the sphere. And I think you will agree that they look very similar, but there has been a little bit of rotation between these two. So, you know, if you look at the whites back here, it intersects with the red one and there it intersects less. So, so there has been some rotation in, uh, uh, or how should I say? Uh, okay, let's, let's say there has been some rotation uh, around this axis, okay, approximately. So in order to find out the rotation, they take these two magnitude spheres and then... Uh, look for the rotation that best superimposes them. Now, for a translation, can you tell me how pictures B and C would change if the... So, let's say we take picture C, or the position corresponding to picture C, and now we translate the patient by half a meter and we take another image of this kind. Sorry, it's a trick question. How would this look before and after translation? Exactly. So it would look identical. Exactly. It, uh, thanks. Excellent answer. So this is a magnitude image. And as we've seen in the shift theorem, translation in space amounts to pure phase modulation in uh, the reciprocal domain. So translation in space would not change the magnitude image at all. However, with the MR scanner, we have acquired the full Fourier coefficient, both magnitude and phase at each pixel. And this is why we can now try and estimate the modulation. And if I had a perfect translation, then my modulation would look like uh, I've sketched here. In practice, you know, you have some noise in the first measurement and some noise in the second measurement. And if you now divide one by the other, you know, this thing will be uh, noisy and dirty, etc. But you can still estimate from this um, the, the principal direction and the frequency. And this will give you the direction and the extent of the translation. So this is a real world application of all of these theorems that we've discussed, the shift theorem and uh, and so on. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you first divide, like we said an hour or two ago, you first, um, after correcting for rotation, you divide the one image by the other image and you get out this face image and this one you can now Fourier transform again to find the principal direction and, and the frequency. And then uh, here are the uh, last images I wanted to show. So on the bottom is uh, an image and on the top I have used a high pass filter. So I've um, set the filter coefficients uh, uh, to 1 in this area, where this is again k-spaced, this is k1, this is k2, and I've set the filter coefficients to 0 in the center, and if I do that, so if I multiply, thanks to the convolution theorem, yeah, if I multiply um, my head image with this filter image, and if I uh, then compute the inverse Fourier transform, uh, sorry, nonsense. So I, I need to I need to uh, first Fourier transform the head. Then this Fourier transform can be multiplied with the Fourier coefficients, and then I inverse Fourier transform to get that head. Okay, so in other words, the, the image on the on the bottom right is what you get if you discard all low frequency coefficients. After discarding all low frequency coefficients. 
and you see plenty of interesting things. So we have retained the edges in the image, but we have lost the information of where the image has been bright and dark. So if you go back to that image here, here we had kept only the low frequencies on the right hand side. We had kept only the low frequencies and we kept essentially only where the image is uh, bright and dark on a big scale, but we lost all the detail. And now vice versa, we keep nothing but the details. We keep all the details, but we lose the information where the original image had been bright and dark. In particular, since we've also thrown away the DC term, we don't, we no longer know what what is the absolute gray values that we're looking at. So I could shift my image, you know, by uh, two or three hundred uh, every pixel uh, in gray value, and I would still get the same uh, high pass filtered result. So thanks to the convolution theorem. This is how I can perform the filtering in the Fourier domain by just multiplying the Fourier transform of the image with the transfer function of the filter. Or I could do the same by convolving in the original space. And here is actually um, the filter in the spatial domain that is the Fourier transform of the filter in Fourier space and well on my screen i see some tiny subtle details here so there's not just the white speck in the middle but there are also a few other points yeah okay i think you just have to take my word for it or try out for yourself so if i wanted to do this in the reciprocal domain, I would take the Fourier transform of the image and I would then multiply it pointwise with my optical transfer function. You remember optical transfer function was the Fourier transform of uh, a filter in image processing and I can then inverse transform to get this result. And what I've shown here was the optical transfer function. And shown on the right hand side is the filter that corresponds to it, to this optical transfer function in the in the real domain. And using uh, you know similar filters you can if it's audio you can filter out certain noise frequencies or you can uh, if you have high frequency noise, you can take a low pass filter to, you know, smooth over it. If we're talking about image processing, you can use this to find edges and so on. Okay. Um, by the way, here at the very bottom, you see a nice collection of online books. Uh, Julius Orion Smith works in audio processing, so it, it doesn't really talk about images in particular, but uh, if you want to look at properties of the Fourier transform and such, I find these books uh, very nice. And then actually the Wikipedia pages uh, on discrete Fourier transform and so on are also quite good. And if you want to look at pretty pictures that explain you how uh, convolution and correlation works and what's the difference between these two, um, there are yeah pretty pictures on Wikipedia and also uh, some applets, uh, let's see if we if we find one, that show you, for example, the approximation quality as you use more or less coefficients. Sorry, this is terribly misspelled. Okay, and I'm not, I have no internet anyway. Go ahead. Okay, so the question is, what is a, a magnetic resonance tomogram limited by? Um, in practice, by the patience of the patient. Because you have to 
acquire in Fourier space these coefficients one by one, and uh, the way the way you move about in K space in MR imaging is by applying magnetic field gradients. So if I want to move here far to the right, I need to apply a magnetic field gradient in that direction. And these uh, gradients can be made very strong. So the real limitation is that uh, for each point that you acquire in Fourier space, you have to excite the sample and then listen to its response. And then smarter MR sequences, um, they uh, stimulate once and then so you send in a radio pulse and then you acquire not just one coefficient but a couple of them. But nonetheless, this is why MR takes relatively long because you need to repeatedly stimulate your sample and then listen to its response. And, you know, a thousand by thousand image has a million pixels. And doing that a million times time simply takes long. But um, if you have uh, more cooperative uh, probes like plants, for example, you can, uh, rather than, you know, living humans, you can produce fantastically high resolution images of these and just you know let them lie in the tomogram for for the whole night and you get very very high resolution images more questions yeah so because because of the symmetry so the question was why in mr acquisition it is enough to simply acquire half the case space because you know if we have a, a real image uh, let's say I have n squared pixels and if I it, let's say it's a gray value image then I need n squared bytes for a real image but the Fourier domain is complex so I need 2 times n squared bytes and uh, however we have not generated any information so uh, there must be some symmetries in there, and I mentioned them. So if the image is purely real, then the Fourier transform has this Hermitian symmetry, and this is why it's enough to, for real images, to know just half of the Fourier coefficients, and then you can uh, reconstruct the other ones from from that. That notwithstanding. Um, Many MR sequences acquire both halves anyway, just as a matter of getting better signal-to-noise ratio. No, it doesn't matter. You, uh, uh, so, so the question was, which half exactly do you need? You can either take the left half, or you can take the top half, or you can take the upper half. It, it doesn't matter. You just need... Uh, you know, it, it has to be... Uh, it's with respect to the uh, inversion center here. You want just one out of the two pixels that are related to each other by reflection around the zero frequency. Um, the number of pixels in the image domain is the same as the number of coefficients in the Fourier domain. And so what, what matters is that you take an, an image of, say, a thousand by a thousand pixels. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I can tell you more details about how to selectively uh, um, stimulate only part of the volume, but I don't want to keep everyone with, with this, okay? Are there more image processing questions? Yes. So you're talking about the accuracy of the numerical operation? Okay, let's talk about it and about the MR. Okay, so this week, in summary, we've talked at length about the Fourier transform and what makes it special. And next week, uh, you, you see, it gives us all the information about the frequency, but none about uh, location. 
Next week, we'll talk about the wave that transformed, which brings location back into the picture and which is very useful for compression and denoising. See you then.